the movie is too on the nose by the end of it, uh, especially the flaming orgasm tree, but <laughs> e- even more so. Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. everybody welcome to the Simcast. this is chris atkinson from cinema sins joined as always by the voice of cinema sins jeremy scott mm-hmm. and from music video sins barrett share you <laughs> such a morning radio show <laughs> yes it is you <laughs> start doing gave the, the finger effect. guns and everything oh geez. buttons on a fucking keyboard and shit <laughs> uh, <ooh, go. laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, we're going to get right into our main topic today. The, um, uh, because uh, Malcolm and Marie, which is a black and white film came out on Netflix, uh, last week, I believe Mm -hmm. we decided that we were going to talk about our favorite black and white movies. Um, uh, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of them. Obviously there was a time where they could only be black and white. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. uh, there was a time where they didn't have to be, but people still did it as a stylistic thing. And when, and that's what we're still doing today. If it's, if anybody wants to do them, they're stylistic, but now there's like some that are older, <laughs> you know, they're, they're like much older than, you know, like just as a preview, like thinking about clerks, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, this movie is 27 years old right how right. in the fuck is this movie 27 years old it's crazy that um, is wild. before we get started chris have you seen malcolm and marie i have okay so you're the only one i i desperately want to because i love john david washington and zendaya and mm-hmm. sam levinson from euphoria uh can you give like a little preview of your thoughts did did you like it yeah i liked it um and I'm the same about John David Washington, um, uh, especially uh, having uh, the chance to like crack open Tenant and watch it multiple times. Yeah. And uh, I've gone over different scenes a bunch of times and everything. And I was just, I just one thing that stood out in that thing is how good he is in Tenant. Um, yeah. yeah, he's great. And and of course, I mean, you know. Uh, I love him in black Klansman. He's just, he's a revelation in that movie. Um, uh, this was a little bit different, uh, from, from both of those movies as, as far as what he's, uh, asked to do this, uh, it's kind of a, um, you could say this is, this could be done as a play if, if, mm. if you really, I mean, it's, it's like a play being filmed. Um, and, uh, it's, a it's about, uh, he's a he's a film director and and zendaya plays his uh girlfriend and uh he this is apparently the best film he's made in his career and he get there's some sort of celebrate oh it's a it's a premiere for his movie and he goes up and he thanks a bunch of people but forgets to thank her Mm. and so there's a whole bunch there's a whole uh conversation that's sort of like boiling to get to that point she's frustrated about something he doesn't know what it is and then they start having this back and forth and he finally gets to the to the heart of the matter and then it opens up more revelations and then more revelations and you and uh you sit there and go i don't know if they're going to be able to survive uh this relationship is going to be able to survive the things that they are saying in this in this scene mm-hmm. um and so that's sort of the the tension that goes throughout the entire thing. It's them yelling at each other, then getting sort of back into this. Oh, we're back to we're we're good again. We're good again. And then something else just just tears it off, and they're back into it. After that, uh, I really liked it. Uh, I know it's gotten some uh, some criticism for various. I don't even haven't even read many of the reviews. The only mm. one that I read, actually, I haven't read any of the reviews. I only read one thing that was talking about how. People seem to be unfairly criticizing the age difference, which is something that we've seen in movies forever. I mean, yeah, and, yeah. And, and the and the article was like, we need to stop doing this. There's plenty of movies that do this, and we never talk about it. But then this movie comes out, and suddenly it's a it's an issue, yeah. you know. And uh, and so um, 
you know, this it's time to stop thinking of actors that you saw as children, you know, as still children when they're 24 fucking years old yeah. and everything. So anyway, I, I very much enjoyed it. I thought it was good. Um, and, uh, performances are good. I think there's some times where you're like, man, they're going a little bit too far, but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. I'll check it out. Uh, All right. All right. All right. Um, so, uh, where do we want to start? Do we want to start with our classic black and white, uh, films that, uh, that we, that we really love? Or? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think we've all got these kind of divided up into, you know, your classic films that are, uh, actually you know, mine are, are classic, but they don't, they didn't have to be in black and white. Um, but, but more of the ones that you think about when you think about traditional black and whites and then more modernish classics and then more, you know, recent movies that, that use it really as a stylistic choice. Uh, so yeah, classic. What are you, what do you guys think? Mm, mm. Um, so my, my favorite of the, the pre like well, where, where things are predominantly black and white is uh is casablanca yeah um uh citizen kane is is frequently cited as the as the best of the you know the pre whatever you want to call it um i don't know this is the golden age of hollywood it's it's Mm -hmm. uh the it's the best it's best all time whatever i think casablanca is more enjoyable it may not be better technically or anything like that but uh, I'm I'm more of a plot person than Casablanca has yeah. more plot yeah. and more mm-hmm. and more intrigue and characters than than Citizen Kane does, um, and uh, and so and it's and it's and it's beautiful to look at. Uh, that's the thing that we don't get to see very much in color these days. I think we kind of get. Uh, I don't know. There's something about the black and white uh, photography that made things pop a little bit better. Yeah. Um, I mean, color, obviously there's a lot of just brilliant color films that have come out, but like, God, the black and white, some of those, it just doesn't seem to capture, especially if you watch a lot of the Carol Reed stuff back in the day, third man and odd Mm. man out and all that stuff is just something popping in black and white, but I love Casablanca. That's, that's, uh, that's my favorite of that, of that era. Very good. Nice. Very good. I was, uh, I was not a fan of black and white anything as a as a preteen or a teenager now we didn't we got our first color tv in 1986 Mm -hmm. i was 11 everything up to that point had been black and white no matter what it was filmed in because we Mm -hmm. only had a black and white television we watched strawberry shortcake my brother and i (laughs) a terrible girls cartoon and we didn't care because it was it was color and it was in our our parents' bedroom. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, if when mom tried to put on what I would call a black and white movie, a movie that predates fun, um, <laughs> I would I would buck that as a as a teenager. I've certainly come to later in life appreciate a lot of these films, but one of the few black and white movies that mom showed my brother and I that I love was Arsenic and Old Lace, Mm -hmm. uh, which is Frank Capra and is uh, a classic. But to me, I'd never heard of this before. I didn't know it was a play. I didn't know any of the actors. Mom just put this in and it was freaking hilarious. Uh, (laughs) And I've seen it dozens and dozens of times since. I've talked about it on this podcast plenty of times. It, Cary Grant just carries the movie, no pun intended. Uh, but it's such a, a wild, crazy farce that and everyone just nails their performance. And um, I just love it. And it was one of the few movies when I, you know, 11 or 12 year old me would be like, Mom's going to watch a black and white movie. I hope it's that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope it's not Casablanca or whatever the fuck. Um, anyway, so that <laughs> that gave me my first appreciation for a black and white film. And it's also really funny. And you should check it out. Oh, yeah. It's a great one. That's fantastic. You know, I, I, I like that. So, I mean, my pick is Psycho, which was 1960, Alfred Hitchcock. He had, I believe, filmed North by Northwest before this in full color. Yep, and used this at that point as an artistic choice. It was also a cheaper choice uh, at that point uh, to do black and white. But man, you've seen colorized versions of Psycho, haven't you guys? No, no. Uh, it it it's not good. 
<laughs> Almost all colorized versions of, are terrible. No, I mean, I've seen some good ones. I think It's a Wonderful Life looks fine in color. Uh, it's not It's not as impactful uh, in color. But I think the same is with Psycho. I think the, the starkness of the black and white works perfectly for that story. And man, you... You put on Psycho, it's what? Uh, carry the one. It's a uh, 62 years old, 61 years old. 61, yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. I'm math. Um, <laughs> it will play just as well and just as horrifying today as it did in 1960. Mm-hmm. Um, because you, if you've never seen it and you don't know the story, you won't see some twists coming. Uh Hopefully you haven't seen the Gus Van Zandt <laughs> shot for shot remake. From yeah. 1998. yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, Anthony Perkins is alternately as charming and menacing as you'll ever see. Mm-hmm. Um, the way that he uses black and white in this, especially in the infamous shower scene, even if you haven't seen Psycho, Psycho you've seen the shower scene uh, mm-hmm. where you see the, uh, the shadow up on the curtain. And then you see uh, the, the, the Bernard Herman score uh, or Herman score. And I mean, it, it, it absolutely will knock your socks off. And the fact that it's in black and white, but didn't have to be even in that age uh, will blow you away because it sets in stark relief. And this is going to be a common theme with this, you know, the, the shadows and the light and the good and the evil and that kind of thing. And there's so many new characters that come into this, this, uh, this story that make it, you know, it, 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 pop. It's a, it's essentially filmed on one location after the beginning of the movie. Uh, but you know, it, it's, it's absolutely delightful. Watch yeah, psycho. Is- if you haven't seen it, we don't, we don't really talk about psycho on this, uh, uh, podcast as much as, uh, the other things, but, uh, it's absolutely integral. I, I'm wondering, and, and I've, <laughs> I have I have seen a bunch on the making of Psycho, and I've probably read a bunch of stuff on the making of Psycho. But uh, is it possible he shot it in black and white because of the of the shower scene, so that there wouldn't be that red blood going down the tub and everything, and 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 having an issue with uh, with uh, the sensors on that one? It's possible. Mm. It's possible because he what legendarily used uh, corn syrup or something like that. Uh, that was yeah. Uh, all, yeah, and of course, if you, I mean, if you do use something like that, it's not going to look like blood when it's color. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. But um, uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I wonder if he, if that was not so much a financial choice as it was a, I want to get this movie slid by the censors and be mm. able to show it in its full glory mm. uh, decision and everything. It could be because at this point, man, it's 1960. Hitchcock is living large at this point. I'm mm-hmm. Figuratively and, and literally. Well, yeah. like, I mean, almost everything that he's made is color at this point. Like it's, he's gotten into, you know, a color uh, film and I think even after this, everything he's doing is yeah, is in yeah, color. Yeah. So the fact that he chose this one movie, like oh, style stylistically, I want to make this <laughs> black and white. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think that's that's doesn't sound right. You know, it sounds more yeah. like he's trying to because <sighs> there's a lot of stuff in this movie where they're just trying to slip stuff by. Uh, I think it's uh, George Stefano who wrote the screenplay. He was like, I. I've always wanted to see a toilet in a movie and I've never seen <laughs> yeah. a toilet. So they've made it part of the plot when she, she flushes that stuff down the toilet and everything. Um, so there were a lot of stuff and it was a lot of stuff in there that they were just trying to slip by and everything. And uh, I, I think it's also funny that during that shower scene, during all the stabbings and everything, uh, someone's like, Alfred, Alfred, I think I just saw a breast. And then and Alfred Hitchcock's like, no, you did not see a breast. There's no breast there, you know. And and uh and and it's and it goes to show how much the imagination, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. that scene plays. Because you don't you 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 can go frame by frame, and I have. No, I'm just <laughs> 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 science hey, that's right that's right but uh it's one of those it's one of those scenes where it makes you think that you've seen something when yeah. you when you yeah. haven't and everything so it's a it's a part of it it's a really good uh you know just part of your imagination and everything so 
Uh, do we All want right. to do another round of classics? Let's move on to the the next one. I think. Okay. Yeah, so I only uh, I only have one for the final one anyway. So maybe we we'll come uh, back to this topic down the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so then we have a thing that's like modern ish. Modern. And I don't know where we would would land on this, but I sort of I my own rule here was post when everything was in black and white essentially, but also not so recent that it would you would you can still attach an ish to it yeah um and so i think in the last 20 years it was no anything before 2000 anything after 1950 basically mm-hmm. is what it mm-hmm. what it came down for me um so modern ish came down to clerks like i said clerks Ooh. uh came out in 1994 which uh, is now officially 27 goddamn years old. <laughs> uh, but um, talk about uh, definitely had to do this due to financial constraints. Kevin Smith <laughs> did this movie and it, and there's been what, you know, the reporting on how much it took him to actually make this movie has gone up and down over the years. <laughs> I think the first thing I heard was like $10,000. He made this movie for, he maxed out his credit cards. He had to use, he had to use a, a, uh, a convenience store slash video store that he was already working at, um, to, to do this stuff like overnight, basically he had all of his friends doing the editing and, or the, the shooting and the being in the, uh, uh, being actors in the movie and stuff like that. So like everything is just cheap, dirt cheap and, and everything. Uh, but it was a stark thing to see back in 1994, a movie that was just plain old black and white, a modern movie, uh, not doing it as a gimmick, not doing it as a like, Oh, well this is, you know, how things were back then. This is a modern movie. This is a contemporary movie. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, but it seems like the, because that movie is fucking raunchy, man. That movie, oh, yeah, Clerks, is. Clerks is one of the raunchiest movies that you'll ever see. And I have a, I get this sense that the black and white and the grunginess of it adds to it. Mm. There's, it, there's like more, it gives it another like fisting. Um, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> there's no better example of this than clerks Two. clerks Two is arguably raunchier than the, the first one. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it. No, right? because it doesn't. it's slick and like right. the ass to mouth is not really ass to mouth. If it's coming out of Rosario. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what was, I was about to say this about clerks Two is that, is that I think he almost made a mistake making that movie. He did make a mistake making that movie color. Um, I agree. I feel like it should have contain it should have kept the 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 vibe of that first one. Uh like yeah, you've got a little bit of money now and you want to make it you want to make this movie the way you wanted to make the first one, but keep it consistent and everything. And I thought that would have been uh you know, I don't know, Clerks 2, I he I think Kevin Smith loves Clerks 2 way more than he likes the first Clerks, but I'm not in that I'm not in that camp. Mm. Um but uh yeah i i love clerks it's just uh i mean it's it, it i had back in 1994 remember we we were getting uh movies uh, in the 90s that we had not we were getting to see some stuff we had never really gotten to see before yeah uh there was a sort of a a carte blanche for the indie movie movement basically um uh we started seeing uh just Miramax and, and Miramax was coming out with all these movies that normally wouldn't hit a multiplex mm-hmm. and, uh, and they were very dialogue driven and everything like that. And, you know, Pulp Fiction came out and I think clerks comes out the next week or something like that. It's yeah. Just, isn't that uh, crazy? Look at this, the, the starkness in the two, uh, of those, you know, Tarantino's mm-hmm. mastering this cinematic technique and Kevin Smith's just doing his own thing, but they come out yeah. right at the same time. Yeah. So, um, uh, but just very naturalistic dialogue, the way people, the way people talk, you know, the way two dudes talk with their friends about, about things, about, you know, life and sex and, you know, all the, and, and, you know, the, and the, the stupid lot that they're in, the, the, you know, work in the stupid stores and all that and, uh, complaining about customers and dealing with customers and everything like that. 
um it's it's very natural and uh everything so i've always hold, held clerks in in high regard i don't think it like super holds up or anything but it's it's still a, a great example of a movie that uh, you know that uh sort of ushered in some more of that indie movement back in the 90s very mm-hmm. good very mm-hmm. good my uh modernish criteria were the same um i, I cut myself off at 2000 um, and so I'm going to go with Ed Wood, um, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, which is, I think Burton's best movie. Um, yeah. and I, I know he's known for the style of his earlier work, but before this movie, my only knowledge of, uh, Ed Wood or what was the plan nine from outer space reference in the Seinfeld episode where they're waiting for a table at the Chinese restaurant <laughs> mm-hmm. and, the Seinfeld's concerned because they're the, the plans are that they're going to go see plan nine from outer space. It's only playing one, one night. And he pleads with people. He's like, it's the worst movie ever made. This is not talking about plans one through eight. We're talking about plan nine, <laughs> the one that worked. Um, and that was the extent of my knowledge. And then Ed Wood uh, came out at a time where I was very interested in uh, movies and reading about productions, six, 12 months ahead of time. And so Tim Burton's making a black and white movie about the guy who made the worst movie ever made. And I, I became interested and it's just it's fantastic. And the stylistic choice perfectly matches the subject matter. Um, and he uses the black and white in a lot of great creative ways. Um, he gets some amazing performances and you know what, honestly, if you take Johnny Depp's Ed Wood out of this movie and put him in a typical Burton film, with a bunch of white makeup on his face, he probably fits right in. He's <laughs> not really doing a yeah. non burtony t- uh, like uh, like Johnny Depp. He's hey, he's still kind of like affecting this this characterization of this man. Uh, but the the movie has so much heart and like it's so clear how much he loves movies, even though he's utter shit at making them, <laughs> um, and he's not deterred. And there's something very pure about that. Um, mm-hmm. And and the idea of that purity being shown in a black and white format. Uh, anyway, I couldn't, I wanted to write Schindler's List and everybody probably expects Schindler's List to be mentioned. And it's a classic, but I'd rather talk about Ed Wood because I think fewer people have seen it. I'm well, and we've talked about Schindler's List a lot, especially during the uh, March Madness stuff that we've done in the past yeah. and everything. Uh, I don't think we get a chance to talk about Ed Wood very much. Um, uh yeah, Ed Wood is a movie that shows you how horrible movies we love are made. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people have tried to emulate this style, which you cannot do. You have to have you have to have absolutely no talent, but you also have to have a hundred percent fervor in what you do um, to be to do something that bad. And so, like he would go out and he was just happy to be making a movie. And a lot of times he was in situations where he shouldn't be out in, you know, he didn't have like, you know, uh, you know, he didn't have the permits to, to do certain things. Um, you know, when he would shoot something and, and just be like, that's terrific. And that was <laughs> a first you know, take. And it's a one take. And, and somebody, you know, the, the people, the, the church guys who were funding that plan nine movie come up to him and goes, it's like, did you see the headstone? It fell over. It's obviously not a stone and everything. And, 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 and he's just oblivious to that type of stuff. It's just, well, that's not important, you know? Um, and, and so you get to, and, and uh, the, the funny thing too, I think, was it you, uh, was it you and I that went to that, uh, Barrett that went to that, uh, um, the riff tracks thing, the riff tracks. Yeah, absolutely. That was hilarious. The, uh, talking about how the actor who keeps, uh, holding his gun in that weird way, <laughs> it was doing that on purpose. Because Ed Wood was not giving him any directions. He's like, this is a loaded gun. What am I doing with this? Not, not gun, but, like, but he but he, he starts doing a, he started doing a bunch of just stupid shit on purpose. I think this the fuck with Ed Wood, and Ed Wood just didn't notice anything oh, that was man. going on in that whole thing. So um yeah, I love Ed Wood. I love Martin Landau won the Oscar that year. I wanted mm-hmm. Samuel Jackson to win for pulp fiction, but I mm-hmm. love Martin Landau in that. Martin Landau's spectacular. And all, really, I mean, you look at Rounders, you look at uh, 
uh, that movie. And you look at his later career. He's had he was he had a great career, but that later part is my favorite Martin Landau, just mm-hmm. because he had so much character. Uh, yeah. Depending on what whether he's playing Bella Lugosi or fucking you know whoever, and there's mm-hmm. an argument to be made that that's Johnny Depp's best performance, especially in a major uh, film. Uh, because yeah, you're right. There is a little bit of Willy Wonka in there, like a tiny bit, but it, but, but it's confined to a human. And I think he found like the humanity in there. And you can arguably say that it's Sarah Jessica Parker's best performance too. Mm-hmm. Because she's got to, she's got to do a lot in this movie, uh, both be kind of like the, uh, not femme fatale, but kind of like the, uh, manic pixie dream girl, I guess in this, in this role. And then, understanding in this role too Mm -hmm. so uh, i think i I think my favorite uh johnny depp is donnie brasco um because (laughs) there's no that there's no affectations yeah that's true uh, in that performance at all when he is with burton there's always that there's i mean it's all every single one of them is like that that's true Um, that's true you want to be a uh, dumpsky (laughs) 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 go ahead and go ahead and try to sell that you want to be a dumpsky (laughs) <laughs> uh, anyway so so my uh modern is right on the edge of that 2000 line it's 1998 in pleasantville yeah uh, oh. and the reason that i picked pleasantville over some woody allen films that i was really eager to talk about is that pleasantville uses black and white as a as a plot point and mm-hmm. that very rarely happens now we saw it a little bit with wandavision uh in the first couple yeah. of episodes uh, you know, uh, this year, but Pleasantville is so engaging, man. You talk about a, a movie that holds up and I think it's because it's in, you know, two, three different eras. Uh, that's a movie that holds up really, really well. Now it's Reese Witherspoon and Tobey Maguire, these two siblings that go into a, a show again, very WandaVision at this point, go into Pleasantville, uh, via Don Knotts. And uh, Reese Witherspoon's all vivacious and horny and stuff like that. And she wants to to fuck the whole town and mm-hmm. turn them into color. And yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, turn them into color. And Tubby Maguire wants things to be as they are because he's obsessed with this, this utopia of a, of a show. Right. Yeah. Also similar to WandaVision. Like you want to uh, make things to where they're all resolved within 22 minutes and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, then you get this wonderful, wonderful turn from Joan Allen, uh, who's in this loveless relationship with William H. Macy, because he doesn't know how to act outside of the honey, I'm home, put my hat on and you're got dinner ready. And that kind of thing. Where's my dinner? Where's, Where's my, my dinner? dinner? <laughs> and then, and then you have Jeff Daniels playing this wonderful character in the diner. Uh, it, there's, there's so much texture literally and figuratively in, in this movie uh, that it's another one that doesn't get talked about a whole lot um, because it, it's so beautifully shot in the black and white. And when you do have the juxtaposition, like uh, when uh, Joan Allen makes herself come in the bathtub and all of a sudden the tree, <laughs> the tree bursts into flames. That is, that is a huge plot point, And it's also a beautiful, beautiful scene. Your honor. Um, I'll tell you why this movie doesn't get the renown that you think it deserves. And I think it, I think most of what you've said is, is on point. The movie is too on the nose by the end of it, uh, especially the flaming orgasm tree, but <laughs> e- even more so, even more so once they start putting up literal, no colored signs. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like the movie at that point is hammering me with a message that I was getting just fine. Now, I don't yeah, put your yeah, eyes yeah, up. yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I'm I got saying you. I got it's you. shot beautifully. It's very charming. The humor in that first, that first hour is solid. Yeah. Uh, the way everything is starting to go wrong with this new presence of these people. Um, but yeah, once that no colored sign shows up, I felt like the movie was sort of screaming at me. And I think that is the only thing holding it back from being a classic classic. Uh, but I do like it. I do think it holds up well. Uh, and what's what's sad to me is that the movie isn't as much about race. That That's an under undercurrent theme. It's more about art. Change. And love. Yeah. And yeah, emotion. Yeah. 
and and feeling things uh but then it gets turned into this it's very volcano they, we all look the same because we have mm-hmm. ash on our mm-hmm. face it's very mm-hmm. in my face with that no colored sign otherwise i think everything else you said is good isn't uh is i haven't seen this movie since 1998 and uh really yeah which is weird i i i wanted to revisit it I actually had, i got it on blu-ray a couple weeks ago oh i bet that's gonna look beautiful it's gonna look awesome um but uh reese witherspoon is trying to bang the whole town mm-hmm. uh but she's not getting the color uh version of herself yet exactly exactly a, and i think the i think the point of it was that she's not experiencing like loving uh emotional sex or something to that nature but it it never made sense to me that uh almost any kind of emotion that goes beyond what pleasantville normally experiences usually would turn someone into a colored version of themselves and doesn't and, she even sleep with a dude who turns to color after that when she doesn't yeah, yeah she does walker? oh who, yeah, i think it might be paul walker yeah paul oh yeah. In the movie. yeah 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 you're right I think you're it's right his character but like sex does turn people c- colorized in the movie just not for her but it's, yeah. but it's a representation of change. She is already like this as she's been transported. I see. Back. I see. She is already. She was already sleeping with banging the whole town. Correct. Correct. And and so this I, is I not a change a metamorphosis. For Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is also uh, Gary Ross uh, has an underrated career. He was the writer for Big and for mm. Dave, two of our favorite mm-hmm. movies. Uh, Trial and Error, which is a fun one. Uh, he directed yeah. Hunger Games, uh, and then I'll leave the free state of jones out of this conversation <laughs> i think he did sea biscuit as well he did with with tobes with the tobes mm-hmm. uh but yeah he's, he's good. the what tobes larone tobes <laughs> um i remember really liking the music in pleasantville and i just Absolutely. looked at, and it's randy newman i didn't remember mm-hmm. that but uh i do remember liking the music kind of playing on those 50s tv show themes um <clears throat> anyway it's kind of it's it, this is a, this is an underappreciated gem on the the same level as ed wood i think um and yeah yeah yeah. i I don't agree (laughs) i don't agree i don't think ed wood has any mistakes i think ed wood is a best picture candidate i don't i don't think uh pleasantville is that i just all right i got you i got you on that yeah yeah, yeah. all right good high five i think the i think the underratitude is probably similar that's that there you go because i'm the guy i agree with that I'll, I'll, you can call anybody underrated or overrated, and I'll agree with you because it's always. <laughs> oh true. yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> it could be carried by an African swallow. <laughs> For the recent ones, uh, I went to last year's Mank. Um, Ooh. For, for this, and um, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna see who uh, did the cinematography on this, but Mank is gorgeous to look at. I'm I'm not sure if Mank is a complete success. Um, it's to me it's uh, it's a it's sort of a revelation uh, of Amanda Seyfried in that movie. She's so fucking good in that movie. Like mm. you've never seen Amanda Seyfried like this before. Um, uh, but uh, it's it's weird that uh, finally we've come full circle, right? The in Ed Wood, there's a there's a scene where Ed Wood talks to Orson Welles, and uh, and uh, it's a it's a Vincent D'Onofrio, I believe, is play, playing him, but it's also Maurice Lamarche doing the voice of Orson Welles in that scene. Oh, I didn't uh, realize that. Yeah, Maurice Lamarche has got the the be- he's the go to uh, sound like Orson Welles guy ah. uh, there is out there, and I don't think Vincent D'Onofrio could pull it off, so they so they dubbed his voice. <laughs> uh but uh but now we're we've got and it's not about orson wells it's about herman mangowitz uh gary oldman plays him and everything but um uh yeah the 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 movie is just beautiful to look at and especially during the scene where herman mangowitz and marion davies played by amanda seyford are walking through what is the the basis for xanadu in citizen kane uh the the photography is just gorgeous in this movie it is uh the cinematographer is eric messerschmidt um it's somebody i'm not familiar with actually let me see what else he's done as far as cinematography is concerned i think it's basically his first movie wow he's done a lot of tv but uh it all the the movie is shot gorgeous and there's something about 
we were talking about how, how black and white looks so amazing when you look at the classic films and everything, but they have a way of really making it look amazing today in 4k and everything mm-hmm. and all the little things that they can dust up and everything. Just the, the locales and everything just look amazing in Mank. Um, uh, we get somebody, you know, with an eye like David Fincher in there and, and, uh, shooting in black and white, everything looks beautiful. Uh, I like the movie a lot. I just, I think there's, I think it's, it drags a little bit in places, mm. but, uh, overall it's okay. But I, uh, as far as modern black and white films, this is what stood out. Nice. Mm. Nice. It's mm. going to be a Netflix I... theme happening here. <laughs> I'm yes, because I, in the mortal words of Jude Law and talented Mr. Ripley, Roma, Roma, Roma. <laughs> uh, I choose Roma. Um, yeah. And uh, to this day, it's still probably the movie that uh, moves me the most. Um, it's not to say it's my very favorite or one that I watch the most often. It's just <clears throat> something special for me. And the black and white. Uh, really, really works, and not only <clears throat> to help like underscore uh, the earlier time frame, um, <clears throat> but also it, the way he shoots it lets things pop. Like that opening scene with the water just being brushed, or mopped away on the floor, uh, and it just it's, it's crisp uh, in a way that black and white is able to do that color isn't always able to do um and Mm -hmm. it just uh it's not an easy movie for me to watch there are difficult parts of it uh and there is not as much joy and laughter as there is difficult parts um but for me it has become uh, an important movie and uh, i can't think of anything in the last 10 years that's in black and white that i would recommend ahead of this alfonso Cuaron. Uh, did the cinematography on this movie um he did I mean, everything he, he did nearly everything on this so like anything the way it looks is based on him uh, yeah and yep. uh i i was a little let down the first time i watched roma and then for some reason i watched it again and it wasn't it was it was either one of these movie club things that i've been doing with the buddies from the old theater and everything uh, or it was some other reason. The second time I went through this movie, I really, really, really liked it. Um, uh, it, it, it there's just more to it on the second viewing than there is on the first viewing. Mm-hmm. The first mm-hmm. viewing, you're kind of getting involved in this slow as molasses, uh, very non-plot movie, mm-hmm. uh, and and you're you're waiting for something to happen. You're waiting for something to happen, and nothing ever happens, and it's a letdown. And then you watch it the second time, knowing nothing is going to happen. You sort of get absorbed in it, mm-hmm. um, and it becomes more. It becomes a. It becomes more of a. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's a comfort food thing or if it's just a. You know, it's a, something that you let wash over you uh, more than. Uh, and no pun intended, because that's what sort of happens yeah. in the movie. Yeah. Well, over. I'll. I'll always remember Dicer. He's part of the Critics Choice Association. Is a professional critic. Mm-hmm. Um, got flown out to New York by Netflix to see uh, pre pre premiere with just, you know, 60 other critics. And I, I will always remember his tweet uh, called it a meal of a film mm-hmm. um, and uh, how it's going to take him some time to digest it. I always thought that was really good. He's great with words, obviously, but I always thought that was a really good descri- description. So when you call it comfort food, uh, I think I know exactly what you mean. It's something that you, you probably can't have every day, because it's too rich or too salty or too, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or too fatty. Uh, but uh, when you have it, it, t- it ratatouilles you back to that place of, you know, pure childhood emotion. Anyway, that's my pick, yeah. baby. There's very few movies that have an iconic scene that, that you'll always, that's burned into your consciousness. And that beach scene, mm-hmm. uh, even though I've only seen this one and a half times, and I liked it a lot but didn't love it uh i i will never forget that beach scene that yeah. was that was something that was completely unexpected was expertly done and was the emotional crux of the entire movie for me um and you know you, you got to you got to hand it to him even if you don't you know, really if you're not on board for the the penis waggling like martial arts scene like <laughs> you're on board for that beach scene 
uh, you're absorbed. If you've made it that far into the movie, sure. you, you're absorbed. The yep. the scene that scene at the end where the kids are lost in the water and everything. I don't think you can ever forget just hearing water just and then you see the kid appear. And it's like holy fuck. It's it's so tense. Yeah. How yeah. that thing is shot. It's so uh, great. It's it's every bit as good as any of the one shots from Children of Men um that uh that of course he's famous for um yeah he 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 may end up being like one of my all-time favorite directors yeah man <laughs> he's on my list he's on the way up yeah uh i have a a modern classic that is again right on the cusp of this is a 2001 movie mm-hmm. uh but it's expertly shot by one roger deacons who you may have heard of. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a movie that we familiar. haven't, uh, that we haven't really talked about much on, on our podcast, the man who wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, oh. This was a, uh, uh, Coen brothers project from 2001. And man, that's, this one is lost to time. Nobody even brings this up in the Coen brothers, uh, discussion. And it is a fantastic movie, completely in black and white, very noirish, unbelievable cast. Uh, centers on a homely barber, uh, played by Billy Bob Thornton, uh, who's, who's married to a carousing wife who drinks too much, uh, played by Francis McDormand. And it's such a simple, like he's, he's, he's just a blank slate in this movie. Mm -hmm. He is an absolute affectless barber that goes about his day, doesn't want anything out of life. All he wants is to be married, to work at the barbershop, and to go back home and do his thing. And there's, uh, yes, there, there. Uh, James Gandolfini is in this. Scarlett Johansson is in this. Uh, it's, it's just a terrific cast, and things do happen. But the guy at the center of it uh, just remains nonplussed, plussed, however you want to say it. Anyway, there is a moment in this movie. Uh, where he's a barber and he's cleaning up and everything. And all of a sudden he's like, he looks at the hair and he's like, this is hair. And his brother, uh, or brother-in-law who owns the place is like, yeah. So what about it? And he's like, this was on somebody's head. It was a part of them. And I just cut it off. And it's the one glimpse of this guy <laughs> having some sort of depth to him. <laughs> and then like he just he's like oh all right and he goes back to sweeping and he's like holy uh. shit but the things around him that hey, he plays it perfectly because the things around him are crazy you know one person gets killed the other person gets beaten to death uh francis mcdormand gets uh, uh gets gets killed uh there's a whole legal plot steve buscemi comes in i think it's no 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 it's uh, tony shalhoub tony shalhoub, tony shalhoub comes in as this phenomenal. he's great he comes in on the defense's dime on on uh billy bob thornton's dime and just lives it up but doesn't do shit uh it's fantastic <laughs> uh and and then you know i'll spoil it it's an old movie but uh you know then he gets sentenced to death and at the end of it he's just like all right <laughs> and and it, it, it makes it sound boring but it's not uh this is such an engaging movie and man when you get roger deakins behind the camera shooting in black and white even 20 years ago uh directed by uh the coen brothers it is magic and it's got all the the noir things you know the uh the lights coming through the slats and the windows and stuff like that but it's more than that and it's a terrific movie that I think deserves a little more recognition. There's a moment uh, when it's a long time Cohen regular John Polito is in this movie yeah, where there's yeah. a, uh, a point where he's sort of suggesting to Billy Bob that they should get in bed together or something like that. Mm-hmm. And Billy Bob into this blank slate that you're talking about. He get, he's just without any like real anger or anything. He goes, that's over the line, mister. <laughs> and, and, and Polito's, Polito's like trying to back his way out of it and he goes back to Billy Bob and he's like right over the line <laughs> right over the line yeah, he's the one I think exact, it's trying to get him exact, into I don't know if that's the exact words he says but but it's something to that to that effect um, that's awesome uh, he's trying to get him into like uh, to invest in uh, like a laundry service like a uh, dry cleaning or something like that. Uh, mm-hmm, yeah. No, this is, this is a great noir. 
it's a it's terrific performances all around and the black and white is great we have a uh, an appearance from scarlett johansson in this movie too Mm -hmm. yeah she's like the uh the little songbird that doesn't have any talent she's like the uh the 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 lady in nashville that uh, that has no talent but is beautiful and <laughs> yeah. uh, you know wants to uh, to have a career. Jeremy, have you yeah. seen this movie? I don't think I've seen this movie. I, I, I this is this is a good this movie is is your type of movie. Scarlett right. Johansson tries to give Billy Bob a handy. In yeah, the she car. does. No, uh, a blowy, a blowy. Um, but uh, there's a point where. Um, uh, it, when that scene, because it causes a wreck, and it's this yeah, classic, he drives off the road. It's this classic Cohen Brothers thing where there's like narration going on while the car is like in midair <laughs> flipping over and everything. You know, there's, there's there's just something magical about about that type of thing. Man, it's so, so funny. Oh man, that's a that's a good movie that uh, everybody should revisit. Yeah um all right well there's 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 a handful of black and white films i mean we could revisit this of course there's plenty of those uh out there but uh yeah that that was fun to go through we got to talk about some movies we don't get to talk about yeah baby um you want to rewatch ed wood now yeah yeah all right everybody it is time to talk about movie (laughs) movie i um I watched a movie that's on there right now called Submarine. Uh, Ooh, it's uh, mm-hmm. written and directed by uh, Richard Ayoade. Um You've seen Richard Ayoade I- I- before in stuff like, um, God, what was that movie where the, it was the the watch, like uh, uh, Jonah Hill and Ben oh, Stiller yeah, yeah, and all, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. that. Uh, that's the only movie that I can recall him being in but he's like a black guy with glasses and a, and some wild, wild hair and um and uh he direct he wrote and directed this movie um based on a book i believe uh but it is oh it's so charming i would recommend this to everybody to go out and find it really uh, on movie because it's just um it's it's a it's it's a coming of age tale it's a it's a guy looking to uh lose his virginity and stuff like that he's looking for a girl blah 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 but like he's so awkward and like he looks at the world in this way that's very unique and everything and uh there's a there's a moment where like his friends are telling him after he's dated this girl for like one week He's like, yeah, you know, you got to, she's got to start putting out, man, blah, blah, blah. You got to, you got to have sex with her and all this. And, and, uh, and, uh, he's like, he's like, I can't, you know, he's like, all right, whatever. So he, they, he goes out with her one, one night and he's like, uh, by the way, my parents are going to a movie tonight. The house will be empty. Uh, they do this every Thursday night. The house will be empty and, uh, the house will be empty. And, uh, I just wanted to say, and, and, she, and she goes, she finally turns to him and she's like, are you saying that you want to have sex with me? And, uh, and he goes, he goes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and so, so they, she goes, give me three, re- write down three reasons why I should have sex with you. So like the next thing you see is like these three things written on his hand that he shows her <laughs> and like number one is like you are madly deeply in love with me and then like two is like something and three is like something and she comes over and just like crosses out the one on the top <laughs> and then she turns to him and goes okay let's do it <laughs> <laughs> it's such a funny movie man i laughed out loud many times in this and what's awesome. interesting uh is so it stars craig roberts as oliver and uh and his girlfriend uh is is uh yeah is played by yasmin page plays jordana but there are uh, a lot of uh Uh, bigger name actors who play like the adults in this who are not the main characters at all but you have sally hawkins in this you have uh you have noah taylor you have patty considine is in this uh there's a there's a lot of people that you recognize and um and it's just oh it's so it's a terrific movie and it's on movie right now i loved it wow strong recommend all right i'm gonna have to check that out strong that's actually under the Sundance favorites, I think. Uh, Movies partnered with Sundance, the film festival, 
to get a lot of these things out on their platform that obviously since the the festival itself isn't taking place you know on location this year uh they're getting it out um they've got uh philip seymour hoffman's last um leading role uh from 2014 in the most wanted man that's mm-hmm. next on my list uh the the ones that i did go through so they've got this uh it, it, the page is fantastic. You go to movie dot com slash cinema sense, and you can uh, you can look at the film of the day, and then you can look at these little uh, subcategories. Like they have a whole thing of Alexander Jodorowsky uh, that's super super interesting. They've got a whole thing about women uh, female directors, which is awesome. What I looked at was uh, these indigenous shorts uh, from Sundance, the Sundance Institute uh, said we want to show more indigenous populations. Uh, from all over the world. And so they've got shorts on there, and one of them is called Mobilize, uh, which is a, the uh, Inuk uh, uh, culture in uh, northern Canada. And somehow I was in, you know, the uh, the, the tundra in this. I also watched a mo- uh, short called Sukumi. And I cannot recommend this enough to you two in particular. Hmm. Uh, this was directed by Andrew ok- Okpiha. McLean uh, from the U S in 2008, but it was shot by, I know you guys like this guy, Carrie Joji Fukunaga, ah. uh, who was behind maniac and true detective and several other things that we James we Bond, enjoyed. right? Isn't he Jimmy Bond? Bond. Yeah. Jimmy and B that trailer is amazing. It is. So Sukumi, <laughs> it stars three people and it's in just the bleakest frozen northern alaska like arctic circle that you can get but it's a compelling human story uh one guy comes up and in a dog sled looking for seals and he comes upon uh the murder of one of his friends in his tribe by another one of his friends in the tribe and he has to figure out what to do now that he's out in the middle of nowhere he's got to deal with the dead friend he's got to deal with the killer friend and i won't spoil the rest of it but it is one of the best shorts i have ever seen and i'm not just blowing smoke here uh i was floored by this to to ring out the human connection in such a bleak landscape was amazing it was amazing and uh i cannot recommend this enough it's called sukumi which means which is the inuit word for uh on the ice and uh, it's played by all indigenous actors. Man, it's so good. So with those recommendations in mind, they still Solid. have other stuff from Sundance. One of our very favorites, Living in Oblivion, starring uh, Steve Buscemi uh, and Peter Dankledge and all kinds of wonderful people. Um, they've got uh, Night of the Living Dead on there. Uh, they've got just an amazing uh, array of films, both in their film of the day things and... Uh, also in their back catalog, uh, Chris, you mentioned that you, uh, you saw that, uh, James Baldwin in Paris, uh, documentary and man, that's, that's transfixing. My God, man. Uh, I don't, don't know how to describe this movie other than it's, it's, it's only 27 minutes short, but mm-hmm. it's these filmmakers from, I think England who want to talk to him. And they're they're in Paris, and he is very distrusting of them. He does not want to talk to them. He does not want to answer the questions that he they're asking because he just doesn't trust them. You can see it in throughout the whole thing. And, and I think they're framing it. Re- they're framing it in a weird context from his perspective, too, right? Yes. Yeah. So you eventually they do get him to open up but you can see that he's reticent to do so because he feels like I, who knows what he feels like he doesn't say he doesn't come out and say but i get the sense that he doesn't want his words to be twisted hmm. um he doesn't uh he doesn't think that perhaps white filmmakers can actually uh do his uh words justice Mm. Um, and maybe he's also worried about what those words might mean when they get out into the, to the public sphere, even though he's living in Paris now and everything, he's afraid of America at this point. 
Um, it is, as Barrett just said, it's transfixing because it, you know, at first you're going to be like, why doesn't he <laughs> just go ahead and say the things that he needs to say? And then you just co- kind of go, he just doesn't trust these people. It's just like watching old, uh, old, but previous uh, footage and interviews of Malcolm X, where mm-hmm. he's like, your supposition that you're basing this question on is inaccurate. It's yeah. it, even in the the trial of the Chicago Seven, uh, your succession guy uh, that plays uh, uh, Abby Hoffman's oh, yeah, uh, yeah. compatriot. Um, He's like, you phrased funny. that question in a form of a, a lie uh, mm-hmm. when they ask about Fred Hampton or when they f- ask about uh, the Black Panthers uh, that he doesn't have representation. And I I love hearing that perspective because that's not a perspective that you hear very often. Yeah, there's uh, a point where uh, they ask him this question, and I'm sitting there going, "My God, this question is so bad," mm-hmm. um, because it it's it says something to the to the to the effect of, "Why do white people like you, this mo- like this book more than black people, or something like that?" And I was I was like, "Where do you come up with that statistic?" Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and he and he goes through a lot of like assumptions during the question, and he immediately goes, "Well, that's a very leading question." Yeah. But <laughs> and, and I see like, through the like, bullshit. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, it's on movie right now. It's meeting the man. Um. Uh. Was it the light? Was it meeting James the man? Baldwin in Paris? Yeah. James yeah. Baldwin in Paris. Mm-hmm. It, James Baldwin in Paris. And uh, it is. Yeah, it is absolutely fascinating to watch. Listen to me, people. Listen. Just listen. Mm-hmm. Just listen mm-hmm. for a second. Mm-hmm. All right? G- get Mubi. Just get Mubi. Get Mubi. Go to Mubi.com, M-U-B-I dot com slash CinemaSins. Here's why I'm saying just get it. Because you get 30 days free when you free. go to Mubi.com slash CinemaSins. It's free. It ain't going to cost anything. You're going to experience wonderful cinema like we've just talked about and much more. 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 For free for 30 free. days. Mubi.com slash CinemaSins. Don't wait. Pause this. Pause this as you're listening to it. And then go to Mubi.com slash CinemaSins and sign up. And it's all yours. You can bathe in the cinematic goodness. It's fabulous. Get it. All right. Uh, do we have any recommends and warns? Totes amaze balls. There, great. It won the Academy Award. Oh, for what? For best movie ever made. Barrett and I feel differently about the same exact movie uh, this week, and uh, not extremely differently. We're not on opposite ends of the spectrum, uh, but he's more on one side and I'm more in the middle. I think we might as well knock this one out of the way because sure, I watched man. it yesterday and I have I have thoughts. It doesn't have to be all my take and all your take. We can go back and forth, but we're talking about Framing Britney Spears, the mm-hmm. documentary that premiered on fx and is now available on hulu although i will admit hulu made it very fucking difficult for me to find Um, seriously oh because it's behind that new york times presents it's behind everything yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. i typed framing space and it was giving me framing jeffrey dahmer or somebody else framing somebody else and and then a bunch of movies that weren't this and eventually i found it but just know uh, they're trying to hide it from you this is a new york times documentary uh, that interviews uh, a handful of people that were in Britney's life at various points, uh, some for longer than others, um, and then some journalists who covered Britney. Um, now I'm <laughs> going to tell you, journalists with a healthy air quote around. Uh, it well, a couple of them have healthy air quotes for sure. <laughs> now, the reason I watched this is I woke up Saturday morning, and uh, Justin Timberlake was trending. Mm-hmm. and on twitter and so i clicked it and again twitter is not you know reliable as an indicator of what the country as a whole is thinking or talking about uh, but there seemed to be a small movement to cancel him uh because of this framing britney spears and the way he treated her um <clears throat> i've been a big fan of justin timberlake for a long time and uh it didn't feel on the nose to me uh it felt a little more like projection. I will say this. The villains, after you watch this movie, the list may be long, but Timberlake's name is not at the top of it. No, Um, absolutely not. And 
I'll tell you who the real villains are here in a minute. The Timberlake section is surprisingly small. When I finished the movie, mm-hmm. I thought I missed something. I went back to rewatch that section again. They 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 talk they show clips of them at award shows and paparazzis as a couple, and then it talks about their breakup. And one of the journalists being interviewed says, Justin made it seem like Britney cheated on him. And it cuts right to another journalist who says, Justin really controlled the narrative after their breakup. <clears throat> Then there's a clip of a radio show, audio only, where a DJ berates him, goads him into, did you fuck Britney, did you fuck Britney, did you fuck Britney, and eventually he goes, I did. And then immediately says, no, 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 that's not true. Yes. And that's about it when it comes to Timberlake. That's it. Uh, I will also tell you, I read an interview Well, hold I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's not it, necessarily. Well, the music video for what goes around, which... No, no, no. Uh, Crimea River. Crimea River. No, it's what goes around. No, it's Crimea River. It was off of Justified. I hate to argue with you, but it's it's Crimea River. It's the, the Britney Spears clone is cheating on him and all that stuff. I agree that the intent of what goes around comes back around, but that was on the 2020 experience. Okay. <clears throat> There's a music video where he hired a Britney clone, and I guess if you if you analyze it super deeply... And you're a big Britney fan. You, you you could get mad about this music video. Um, you know, I feel like Taylor Swift has had some ex-boyfriend stand-ins in her music videos. And <laughs> nobody ever talks about that. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I guess, at the, I don't know this video, but I guess at the end of it, she dies? Uh, no. Or it's implied? No. She dies? No. What the fuck? <laughs> That's what I had read, was no. that... He made a music video glorifying the murder of his Britney ex. <laughs> okay. So then it's just, it's even more harmless than I thought. Yes. Um, it's, okay. Let me explain why, why you're there. Let me explain the thing. This is off of Justified, his first record. Arguably one of his best songs. It's Cry Me a River. Uh, he, shows, he shows up at the outside of this opulent mansion. And there's this blonde lady that's getting into the shower. While she does that, he breaks into her place, films a video of him making out with another girl, and puts it on her TV to where when she comes out of the shower, she sees him getting revenge on her for cheating. Okay, so I... Okay, that and everything else I said, being the contents of the Timberlake stuff in this documentary, he's not the villain. Uh, I agree. I have I have read things um, that he may or may not have said, at this time, to his bandmates, that's not contained in this documentary. I read mm. an interview with the filmmakers. They specifically didn't even ask him to participate. They basically begged Britney for yeah. months and months, and yeah. they didn't even ask Timberlake. And they said, we didn't feel like we were we were targeting him in any way. Um, so that was my first reaction was, well, this documentary doesn't say anything really that bad about Timberlake. And... Uh, what it does say that I think it bears some weight is the media's uh, reporting of the breakup and uh, how they were more favorable to him than to her. The, the, the theme of the entire film is that the patriarchy has failed Brittany time and time again, and they're correct. Um, I make this a wreck of warn. Um, I was frustrated by the same exact bush in the background of every single person that was interviewed. <laughs> It's like the um, Homer Bush from that like gift. Find a, <laughs> find a Zoom background or some shit. My God, it got rip, so repetitive. Uh, but the recommendation is that you, I think we have forgotten, especially post uh, the Me Too movement, exactly how she was treated by the media. Uh, and I mean both the media like Diane Sawyer and people who would ask questions like, what did you do to break Justin's heart that you would never ask? Fucking Ed McMahon, when she's 10 years old, is saying, do you have a boyfriend? Um, yeah, what about and, me? <laughs> and so she was sexualized from this young age. But then there's the, all these shots of literally hundreds of paparazzi, like following her every move, not letting her drive her car uh, because they're trying to get a million pictures. And the film interviews two people connected to this industry, and they're both the devil. Um, the first one was the was the guy who worked for Us Weekly mm-hmm. or Us Magazine yeah, uh, yeah. for ten years, mm-hmm. and he bought photos from paparazzi. He had a hundred and forty thousand dollar budget a month to buy paparazzi pictures of famous people. The other guy they enter, and he has a smirking, shit eating grin the whole movie. Like yeah. I'm just an executive. He even says at one point that picture was very lucrative for us. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> 
And then they interview an actual cameraman. This is the guy, if you remember, when after she'd shaved her head, um, she assaulted a paparazzi vehicle with an umbrella. She beat on the umbrella or beat on the vehicle with an umbrella. This dude interviewed is the guy that was his vehicle. Yeah. He followed Brittany for four years, taking pictures and video of her. And he literally in this documentary looks in the camera and says, she never gave us any indication that our presence was bothering her. Yep. Yep. And the the interviewer says, and this is another problem I have with it. But the yeah, I want to ask you about this. The interviewer says, what about when she said, leave me alone? And he said, well, she would say, leave me alone for the day. But she was never like, leave me the fuck alone forever. Um, this guy's the devil. You on Twitter, you people, you should have been talking about this motherfucker and the guy from Us Weekly and her fucking dad. Because these are the people who have really mistreated her over the years. The real problem is the, narr- the interviewer... Of, uh, continually breaking into this film the, the director is continually asking questions their own voice on camera leading the witness so to say and every time that happens in a documentary i knock off points because you cannot fully just observe anything i realize that by a, by making a documentary you're impacting the subject that you are trying to document uh but you don't have to become part of the film and if you cannot get the content you want for your film without your voice on camera asking the question to add context, maybe there's not enough material here for a film. <clears throat> Can I ask you something, that. though? Sure. About that particular instance that you mentioned. about she was, she was checking him on it? Correct. If, if in real time he's making an objectively false statement, we had this all the time with Trump. I know that's a very different... Uh, situation but you know when he said she never asked us to leave her alone how are you going to get the truth out of that unless the director says she literally told you leave her alone and then you see his stumbling he's not on trial you're 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 not trying to change his mind or get him to admit anything you're documenting him and he we've already seen enough footage that this guy shot to know he's lying when he says to the camera, she never gave us any indication that our presence was bothering her. You leave it right there, that's way more impactful. In fact, when she asked the question, it lost its edge for me. Because That's interesting. Yes, you call him on it if it's in court, if it's a deposition, if you're not making a documentary. The documentary is, this guy's an asshole. Well, right? this, no, the do, well, you're, you're right, you're right. And again, and again, we agree a lot more than we disagree on this. Agree, yes. So, but... I think that because the guy tried to couch himself as, you know, when you're in the the business at that point, you know, I wanted to be a filmmaker, but when you're in the business, yeah, that's all you can think about. And I didn't really do anything wrong. I just kind of kind of got caught up in this, meaning that he has now since moved on and he sees things differently. When she did check him on that, then he's he's making justifications. He's like, no, I still think what I did was fine. And so it's showing a different perspective of that subject, right? He's not on trial. You're absolutely right. But he's basically saying, no, 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 no. We were okay. And then when she said, no, objectively, you are not, he still believes we were okay at that point. If you can't tell the story without inserting yourself into it, you don't have enough footage. All right. You got enough. You got enough footage. You just as soon as he says she never gave us any indication that our presence was bothering her, you cut right to this guy's own camera, recording her in tears, saying, "Why won't you leave? Let me leave. You're blocking my car." And you make your point that way instead of calling him on it in the interview and inserting yourself into the process. It's a real. Maybe I'm alone, but it's a real pet peeve of mine when it comes to documentaries, and I blame Michael Moore because he's gotten away his entire career with calling his films documentaries when they are not. They are who actually makes a cameo in this documentary. Yes, they are. They, but he's one of the best points in this documentary. He's <laughs> yeah, one of the exactly. few people who was saying, "Why don't we just leave her alone?" Yeah, yeah but yeah. he inserts himself into the story and manipulates a series of uh, mixed media to make a point he set out to make. And you don't, as a, in my opinion, you don't as a documentary, and you don't set out to, to to make a specific point. You you set out to document something, and that that takes you to the point. So does that simply get better if you take out the question though? Like, do yes. You, and just, and just, you just show them saying the answer to the question. Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. Uh, because, because, you know, I know every one of those people being interviewed in this documentary were asked questions to prod them, to get them talking. I understand that as a human being, that's part of the process. But when you show it to me, you're now you're not documenting. You're, you're participating. 
Yeah, that's sort of a thing that you'll see in uh, the the four part Reagan's thing is that they mm. don't they don't ask questions. You don't hear it hear it off you know off the screen or anything. It's these people un you know seemingly unfettered and just talking basically, and they're not making any judgments on what they say. But man, some of the things that some of these people say about Reagan who were with them and everything are just very unironically in love with him uh over some things that you just shouldn't be in love with him over you know and you know you're talking about jim baker and all these people who were like sitting there was, you know you sit there and listen to him wax poetic about how he fired all those guys he yeah, fired yeah. Them and we loved it and blah 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 <laughs> and you know and that's basically what it comes they don't they don't prod uh or anything uh during the documentary they prodded you know all you know off camera they cut it out uh but you know i think that's what jeremy's sort of getting at there you can get these answers don't make yourself stars in the in the thing at the same time yeah i think this guy could have said she never gave us any indication and you cut to some footage of the paparazzi and cut back to him going she might have said leave us alone for the day but she never said leave us alone forever. Why are you jogging? You're manipulating footage the same exact way as you would asking a goddamn question, though. No. Yes, absolutely. No. If you cut to something that is contraindicated, yeah, you can you can absolutely frame it any that's way what, that you want to. That's my point. That's my point. There's evidence he's lying. I don't need the interviewer to say so. They've got footage that proves it. I'm not manipulating anything. I'm telling the same story that they are. I'm just not putting myself in it. I bet you if you look at the IMDb, they're listed in the cast just because they spoke. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. I don't and, think and you and I would know, I disagree about... I mean, do, all documentaries are manipulating footage. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fact. So <laughs> They've I been don't doing that it. since Nanook of the North. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so I agree with you there that I would be manipulating footage in that sense. I'm saying, like Chris is saying, you take the question asker out of it. Uh, you don't, there's no reason for you to be a participant in the story you're trying to tell. And the only exception, I, I had some people on Twitter kicking back at me, and the only exception I came up with was that tickling documentary where they were they thought they were documenting one thing and it turned completely fucking sideways on him and got almost criminal and the story changed and so he became a participant of what he intended to document that's more forgivable than an interviewer off question prodding somebody if you, if you prod them all you want just cut that shit out in the edit all right so i think it's more of a stylistic choice than uh than a narrative choice because it's the narrative ego. is the same it's whether ego. you cut to footage or you cut do you include the the director it's well ego. yeah I mean, it's the same thing i i the what what jeremy's talking about where i hate w when they do that type of thing is when you watch i mean and, and these are not serious documentaries but they'll be talking about something and they'll cut to some scene of the person acting crazy or something like that and it's completely out of context from what they're talking the subject of what they're talking about is. yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, you know they do that in trailers a lot somebody will ask a question and then something from an hour later in the movie <laughs> someone answers it and it's yeah. not even like you know <laughs> it's like oh hell no <laughs> yeah yeah you know i mean i i i i don't like that either there there's not much way around it you have to have a perspective right you can't just sure. there are there are there are documentaries out there that do that whole we don't know what happened. Here's what they say happened. And my God, man, they're not only good, but they're, but they're frustrating. Catherine, mm -hmm. the Freedman's is one of those. Oh, Catherine, yeah. the Freedman's yeah, yeah. is one of those where you're just like, Oh, definitely some really de bad shit happened at this place. And then you'll hear somebody else talk and they're like, well, yeah, we, we did a bunch of computer stuff there. I don't remember anything serious. You know, like, fuck what happened there? Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like, is there, is there, is there any way of knowing? And I think that's what movies like capturing the Freedmans do is like, there's not really a way of knowing a lot of times what happened. Um, but yeah, maybe anyway. this is best tied back to broadcast news where William Hurt had one camera on the shoot and he teared up when his interview subject teared up 
And the producer set off camera. Oh, that was great, your reaction. And he's like, oh, I can do it again. And they set up the camera again <laughs> to film him crying a second time. <laughs> and as Holly Hunter says, you became a part of the story. Um, mm. You yeah. inserted yourself into the story. Uh, that's how it makes me feel. Now, quickly, back to the documentary. I think it's worth watching. Uh, I have critiqued the background of the interview subjects. I have critiqued the interviewer speaking up. Um, but I... I was moved uh, by watching some of what she's had to endure over the years. I don't know how to feel about the free Britney conservatorship thing, which is a pretty big part of this movie's yeah, point is that she should be freed. But they talked to an, an attorney who I thought was the most level-headed guy. They talked to the gray haired guy mm -hmm. who Britney, he interviewed Britney and Britney wanted to hire him to represent her as her attorney in this conservatorship thing. Um, and he says to the camera, I, I talked to her. She seemed of sound mind. She knew that she was hiring me for this and why. And the courts wouldn't allow it. They, they said no, and they appointed their own attorney for him. And this guy, who should be biased, says, but there's also that report that I never got to look at, and I don't know what's in it. And so I can't really say. They circle back to him at the very end of the movie after all the Free Britney stuff comes back up again. And he says again, we don't know what we don't know. There's some portion of that conservatorship that's sealed from the public. Um, and if an attorney that interviewed her and wanted to represent her isn't willing to say free Britney, for legal reasons at least, I will say the movie is pretty damning to conservatorships in yeah. general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and also pretty educating in that regard. Yeah. Um, and so mine is a wreck of worn, um, uh, but that's, you know, half Recca. And Barrett is a, just a full recommend, right? I do, because I, I think it, it does go uh, beyond just a uh, a look at Britney Spears' rise to fame. They don't mention the chaotic show. They don't mention, you know, all of her boyfriends that, that come and go. And, they skip over a whole husband. Yeah, exactly, right? And, and they don't get into the salacious details only uh, other than to point out the hypocrisy of the media at the time. Yeah, um, especially viewed through 2021 eyes. And then it does put the conservatorship uh, process uh, on on blast, basically. So I, in, in that respect, it goes past the documentary. They're using Britney Spears as an example of what happens around her. And and it does paint a very sympathetic portrait of her. Um, and And it's one that I participated in back in. 2007, 2008, I made Britney jokes. Are you kidding me? You know, big pop star shaves her head in the middle of everything. She's partying with Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan. Yeah, I made jokes. And and what's funny, some of these, I love Wesley Morris, a New York Times critic. Um, and he is one of my favorites. I love Dave Holmes, a uh, former MTV uh, yeah. VJ. And he's great in this. But they act a little sanctimonious here, like... Oh, yeah. oh, well, no, you know, everybody was saying that Britney was this piece of meat, man. It, it, were you yeah, not TV? Were you not? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, you know, we're, we're all in a better place now, hopefully. But anyway, I, I do want to make one tangential point. Uh, you are correct in the fact that what goes around comes around does end. The music video does end with his girlfriend's death. His girlfriend is played by oh. Scarlett Johansson uh, in this mini movie. And uh, but it's not anything about cheating or well, an I confused the two the videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was off which Future one does Love Sounds in Which one is the documentary ripping on then? Crimey River then? Crimey River was the, the one. Yeah. yeah. But you could also, if you're going to criticize him for making a video about his ex, you could say the same about what goes around comes around. You don't think Scarlett was hired because she kind of looks like Britney? No. That's what I read. But I guess I just confused the two. I videos. could have missed something, but but the Crimea River was the direct comparison, especially okay, because right. it came out right after that relationship ended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, yeah. So <laughs> go watch Framing Britney Spears if you can find it on YouTube. We just spent thirty minutes on a documentary. <laughs> uh, I was about to say, um, I and I, and I was like, does that count for both of y'all's? Yeah, it does. Okay, it does indeed. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, uh, recommend a movie that is fucking light years away from that fucking movie that you guys talked about. <laughs> 1986's Ruthless People. Ah. I remember this, this is movie. the last movie that David Zucker, Jerry Zucker, and Jim Abrahams made together. 
it is nothing like anything that they made before, like Airplane or Top Secret. Uh, this is based on uh, uh, another person's screenplay, and uh, and uh, it's I I love stories like this. This is as Jeremy movie as it gets, I believe, because it's very uh, very uh, farcical. Have you ever seen this, Jeremy? Uh, no, I don't think I have. It's a farcical movie. It starts off with Danny DeVito uh, talking about how he married Bette Midler because he figured that her dad was going to die soon and he was going to get a lot of money. Mm. Um, but you know, as he as he is talking to someone he is currently sleeping with in this scene, not Bette Midler, <laughs> uh, he uh, he's he's telling he's telling her that uh, he you know he he this guy held on for a long time. And during this time, while he's been married to Bette Midler, Bette Midler is awful. He doesn't like anything that she does. He hates the way she licks stamps, um, all <laughs> these type of things. Uh, and he tells this, this woman, I'm going to kill her and I'm going and, and, uh, and, you know, make it look like an accident and all this. So this, so Danny DeVito goes home to kill Bette Midler um and uh she's not there and he gets a phone call from this couple played by judge reinhold and helen slater mm. judge reinhold calls and says we've kidnapped your wife and if you call the cops and if you call the if you call the uh the media we're gonna kill her and he's like oh Oh, so I shouldn't do any of these things. The next scene is all the media in the fucking world is out on his lawn. Uh, there's cops everywhere. And then he thinks that uh, that uh, she's going to die at the hands of these kidnappers. But Judge Reinhold and Helen Slater, they are not killers at all. The only reason why they kidnapped her was because Danny DeVito and Bette Miller stole uh, a fashion idea and that's the reason why devito is rich today they stole one of helen slater's fashion ideas and they don't have any heart at all to kill it in fact there's a very uh funny like moment at the beginning where like uh judge reinhold's talking about killing bet midler and he and he sees a spider walking across the floor and instead of killing it he just picks it up and puts it out on the porch. He does end up stomping on it, which I think ruins the ruins the joke. But uh, but he he it's it's pretty clear he can't kill a person. That's for sure. Um, meanwhile, the woman that Danny DeVito is sleeping with is cheating on him with Bill Pullman, who is in his first role. Oh wow! This wow. is his first movie role. Hmm. This woman says. He's told me where he's going to kill her. Why don't you go out to this place and record it and I can use it to blackmail him later. Uh, so Bill Pullman goes out to this place. Of course, there's no murder going to happen because Bette Miller's been kidnapped. But on this very place, the police commissioner of the town is having sex with a hooker in the car now bull pullman bull pullman doesn't know what danny devito looks like so he thinks that this is the woman that he's killing and everything and so they're having sex and he's like sitting there recording it and everything and she's making all these noises and he thinks that he's actually killing her during <laughs> the scene uh. um, and so he's got all so they so then there's this all this I thought this was happening. So this is what I'm doing. And this is what I, it's very Frasier esque if you want to, where there's a lot of assumptions going on about what has happened and what motivations there are and what, and, uh, and everybody is, is sort of like just one step, you know, one step removed from where they need to be to understand what's going on in the entire movie. And I, I loved it. Uh, I haven't hmm. seen it in forever. I saw it way back in the day because I was a big Zucker brothers and abraham's fan and everything but considering it's nothing like top secret and airplane i was disappointed in it and i was way too young to watch this movie too <laughs> um uh but uh yeah uh highly recommend ruthless people i think that both of you would love that movie interesting Very i good. remember uh really liking it it's dark right i mean mm -hmm. it's comedically dark this is what Danny DeVito was known for in yeah. the mid to late eighties. He was in a lot of these movies like war of the roses and, um, 
throwing uh, and even train. romancing the stone is kind of dark yeah romancing the stone uh there the there was seemed like there was another one they did throw mama uh, from the train throw mama from the train was another one um and i think there was even one more that i'm, I'm trying to think of but i can't think of right now uh, but anyway, that's what he was really known for, DeVito, back in the day. Um, uh, uh, there's a, I was reading some trivia on this, and uh, DeVito apparently called Midler a couple of times after they made the movie. And uh, and uh, one, I think the first one was before they made it, and they're like, it's good to be, we'll be able to work together and blah, blah, blah. The second one was... Uh, Oh my God! What a piece of trash movie we're in. They they were so worried about their careers and wow. like how it was going to, and it ended up being, I believe, the eighth most uh, eighth most profit. Well, it made the eighth most money in the United States in 1986. Oh, uh, wow. It was a top ten hit in uh, in 1986, um, uh, which was it's surprising. Uh, you would you wouldn't think a movie like this would be like in the top ten, but it definitely was uh so um i i was uh i was i was very happy to revisit this i thought it was really good is it other people's money that you're thinking about i mean he was in a lot of yeah there's a ton of these right (laughs) yeah Uh, i feel like there was another one with michael douglas and kathleen turner but i mean i mean they had they had romancing the stone they had war of the roses but i thought maybe there was another one that was sort of in there but it it may i may just be thinking of romancing the stone well he was in jewel of the nile too yeah besides that yeah. um uh i was i was thinking that it was some because i think he directed war of the roses yeah i think so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um uh, so, so those three had been involved. I, I, I just thought there was another one, but I think I was thinking of romancing the stone. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, really good. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. So, uh, I like I would, that I period, would... uh, period DeVito, you know, all the way up until get shorty. Like he's, he's, he's got, he's such an unconventional oh, leading man, man but he's... you know, he kills it. He's hilarious in Get Shorty, man. And they they set up they set up a lot of stuff with Get Shorty where they where he's like on every magazine cover. Uh, you know, I just watched Get Shorty yesterday. <laughs> oh yeah, um, she goes. So- she, they fucking kidnap her. Delroy Lindo takes her back, throws her in the bathroom at his apartment, and she looks next to the toilet. There's a copy of Martin Weir's book. And she goes, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and, and it's, it's Martin Weir. He, his name is spelt W I E R and it's weird tales, W I E R D tales. Uh, but like every single magazine cover has got him on there where it's just like, it's, and, and there's that scene, the scene I love the most and get shorty. Uh, with him is when he goes to visit uh, Travolta and everybody and Gene Hackman at that restaurant and he orders this shit that's off menu <laughs> and uh, and they're sitting there talking about the movie and he gets and as soon as he gets done talking about the movie he gets up and walks off before the food has even has even arrived <laughs> you know he's it's uh yeah, I may be remembering it wrong oh well maybe you're about to say that does Travolta like give him a look and just kind of like look well, no, what I was gonna say is what sells that is Rene Russo says something before he shows up like you watch, he's going to order something that's not on the menu and he won't even touch it. And then <laughs> a few minutes later, he does exactly what she said, but it's not <laughs> like addressed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. So we had a, a, I guess a short recommend and warn uh, section there. Uh, it's, it's long, but it was short yes. uh, because we, uh, I recommended uh, ruthless people and you guys collectively recommended and rec warned, uh, the Britney Spears. What's the Britney Spears documentary called again? Framing, Framing Britney, Britney Spears. Spears. Framing and it's presented Britney by Spears. the New York Times. So that'll be like the cover that you see on Hulu if you watch it on there. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's going to be it, I believe, for today. Yeah, we got some questions lined up for the next one. Yeah, we do. Um, all right, that's going to do it for this week. Keep going to Sincast presented by CinemaSins on Facebook. We're also on CinemaSins Twitter, Music Video Sins Twitter. We're on uh, Discord. If you want to get on Discord, you can go to our Reddit page and find a link on the right pa- right side of the page there. Or you can uh, private message me on Facebook, and I can give you a link there. We're also on SoundCloud. Uh, that's going to do it for this week. It's Chris Atkins and Jeremy Scott. Barrett Share. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, 
Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasins.com. Hey, so you didn't like Lois and Clark at all? I like never watched that shit. Fundamental, you, you didn't? No. Uh, that was targeted at my mother's age group. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Really? That show I was not targeted it. at boys. That I was, was... At like I was like uh, what thirteen, fourteen, or something like that, and I masturbated to it. Well, that's different. That does. That's different. You that masturbated different. to Superman. Well, to Terry Hatcher. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought that show was delightful. It had uh, sure. your boy from uh, from uh, my cousin Vinny is Perry White, and it had uh, probably somebody that's now famous as Jimmy Olsen. Yeah, you were thirteen. It's I'm just saying, if you had been seventeen or eighteen, you would have seen it as something. I mean, that show was about romance more than it was action, and you you goddamn know it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Maybe maybe I'm just a romantic. <laughs> so I think I think it's interesting that this one is the new one is flipping the title. So instead of Lois and Clark, it's Superman and Lois. So yeah. I think they're hinting there's going to be more action uh, than the the previous iteration. The trailer looked decent, but I don't watch any of those shows. I watch. I've I've seen a decent amount of Arrow and some Flash, and I kind of like that shit, man. Like I could see myself really getting into that whole universe. I hear they're great. I just haven't. I just haven't watched them. I mean, the only reason I watch Arrow is because my wife and my son got into it for some reason. My wife doesn't like superheroes at all, but for some reason, the soap opera ness of it got her. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, it's got decent performances. And I tell you what, man, those action sequences are no joke. Like they put their stunt people in full masks and makeup, so you can't tell who's who. And they don't do, I mean, I'm sure they cheat here and there quite a bit, but they'll do a long take of people like actually doing the shit. And one guy, the guy who played, uh, Arsenal, the guy with the red hood, uh, he had to quit because like physically he couldn't take the stunts anymore. The dude that played arrow competed in that fucking ultimate athlete obstacle course show. Oh, like, Stephen Amell. Yeah. Do you know that show I'm talking about where they, they run, it's like a, American yeah, Gladiator's like obstacle. Tough Man, Tough Mudder, or fucking like it's Ultimate always, Iron Man. It's super impossible. Um, he competed in that. I think he won. I think. I mean, I, I think he completed the course. Oh, but shit. he's no joke, man. He was. He was definitely the real deal. No, that's what everybody. Everybody in that show it, can handle their shit. <laughs> I think that's probably a requirement where they're like, okay, you look great. You can act a little bit. But also, I need you to get ripped. <laughs> That's the whole thing. That's the whole rumor about the Pattinson uh, Batman thing is that he didn't have COVID. They had to shut down because he showed up on set like chunky, like he wasn't in shape. And Reeves was all like, You're, what the fuck? And <laughs> why would I have you... seen this persistent rumor. <laughs> Why would you why would you come up with COVID for that fucking rumor? I don't know about the COVID cover up may be a lie, but I have seen multiple rumors <laughs> at multiple points in the year that he had shown up out of shape and that yeah, that was what sparked he and Reeves like he and Reeves apparently don't like each other. That's that's just that's just wrong. There's no fucking way that they invented a COVID diagnosis <laughs> just to cover up for his chunkiness. I, I agree that that's that's probably a little, I can't I, believe Robert Pattinson can get chunky. <laughs> I've well, never seen him like it may over not have like been chunky as pounds. much as it was just you know not ripped. Um, but it's crazy that that I mean they put out a trailer for that thing like God like ten months ago. Yeah. Like do you remember? Oh yeah, and, oh yeah. And they took this huge break and now they're back to filming. It just feels like that movie's been in production for forever. All they would have had to say is there was a COVID scare on set and or or some other thing. They wouldn't have to go come right out and say, Robert Pattinson has COVID. And, <laughs> the fat and, kind. Yeah, exactly. The fat kind. And just be completely, you know, just I mean, there's there's no reason for that. I don't oh, get it. Oh, man. <laughs>
I'm just saying, <laughs> rumors are they don't get him. along, and that it all started back that there with uh, him not showing up in the shape that Reeves wanted. They're still in production, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> I do think it's a mistake for them to have so many fucking Batman things going. Like this, two two different Batman timelines apparently, and they're going to do on HBO. Reeves is producing basically an edgier version of Gotham. Like they're going to do, it's called Gotham PD. And I just don't think anyone realizes how little I give a shit about the police department in Gotham. Well, there's also the Alfred stuff, right? There's a Pennyworth show. show, Yes. And, and then fucking, I think Affleck and Michael Keaton are going to be in this flash movie. At least Michael Keaton is. And he, they said he's going to be the, Main DCEU Batman. <laughs> they're going to do an animated thing. And then they're going to have the Justice League Snyder cut. Oh, man. That was a funny thing in Charlie's Angels when they're like, Michael Keaton's Batman. And it's like, Ben Affleck is Batman. And Elizabeth Banks is like, is he though? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I, I still haven't seen that. <laughs> oh, it's not great. It's not even good, but it's just not as bad as everybody says. And it, I'm charmed by enough of the people in it. <clears throat> so you're off Miley, but you're still on case, dude. Yeah. Yeah. For now. I'm not off Miley. I'm just, it's, it's <laughs> softened. We don't need to bring up. <laughs> we don't need to it a little bit. <laughs> we don't need to bring up my exact verbiage from the Slack thread. I just, I don't feel that crush anymore. And, you know, maybe when she meets me, that would be enough. That's uh, true. I feel like, I feel like you've got a, a, as much of a shot as anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> be awesome. Show her some of your doodles. Be awesome if, if you, you and your wife, uh, um, like, uh, exchanged your, you know, celebrity to-do list or whatever. And they both had Kay Stu on there. Well, and she had 10 names and you had Kristen Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> all of whom live in the nashville area yeah exactly oh man <clears throat> luke bryan <laughs> daryl hall yeah. morgan whalen oh wait have i yeah. told you about the island hunters thing kick that i'm on trying to buy your own island yeah i've looked at this before i don't think you tell me you were on this kick I usually there, find it's one of those the- shows on like uh, like HGTV or something oh, like that. Oh, I thought you were like saying Barrett is personally looking at buying his own island. I'm not saying no. <laughs> I'm saying that I'm watching that that show, and like you buy a decent size house, you're not that far away from purchasing a functional island off the coast of Nova Scotia or something like that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Now mm-hmm. you got to deal with the winters, mm-hmm. but like. Yeah, the summers are spectacular. And if you can pay like what? Mid range is like six hundred grand for an island with a place that you can live with electricity. How much and land are like we a dock? About? Usually about like three or four acres. Now not enough for you probably, but it's also a fucking island. It's not well, like how far away are the other islands though? Some of them are close. Yeah. I, look, there's a million islands out there. I'm just saying that I could probably find one. Yeah. If I had some scratch laying around, sure to uh, to you know live maybe ten months out of the year, and on the cold months, you know, sleep on your couch or something. Yeah, that'll happen. happen. (laughs) What? You can't sleep on your couch? You got like three couches. Hey, um, that's actually true. I do have three couches. (laughs) I'm just saying, island's not uh, not so bad. It's not so bad, Chris. You could get an island. You get you get some extra island dough laying around. I'm sure I do. I don't know what how much do how much are they going for these days. I'm saying you could probably get a mid. Rob Schneider owns an island, or he did, right? Yeah, but that he got because for like of all that sweet. Grand. It's all that sweet demolition man money. Yeah, that's true. That's it. But he said he yeah. paid like six hundred grand. You watch these island hunter shows. You get mid level island, a decent amount of space, not too much space. You know, either Caribbean. Or off the coast of Canada, or like uh, off the in the uh, Chesapeake area, six hundred grand. Why don't oh we? God. Why don't we? Why don't we think bigger though? Because yeah. um, because uh, space exploration is going to be a lot more you know viable with all these uh, wealthy entrepreneur people Ooh, uh, making it happen. Asteroid. 
Yeah, own asteroid, <laughs> own own planet. Um, as and and there are, there are all sorts of like uh, uh, companies building things that you know make uh, space living better and everything like that. Mm-hmm. They're building like these awesome like houses that are easy to construct and everything. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. easy con- uh, easy comparatively to to build. And uh, and yet you could just put it on one of these planets and have it temperature controlled. You know, eventually somebody's going to create the authority to sell land on the the Mars or the moon, right? And Mm -hmm. people are going to jump at it. I own 100 acres on Mars, and I'm going to laugh at those people. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you mean they're going to purchase it, but obviously never experience it, right? It's like that's a my yes, hackers, unless you unless shareholders. <laughs> unless your entire point is that your grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren can live on Mars, then you're just throwing money away. Mm-hmm. And I don't think Mars is viable anyway. Um, the moon is much more likely just because it's so fucking close. Well, think about what Andy Andy Weir was saying. Like we haven't explored all the ocean. You could build. It's easier to build something in the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. that's habitable than it is on the fucking moon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's absolutely right. He's you know, we could we could have a whole Naboo. I'm just we saying could. they're going to do could. it. They're going to they're going to start with the moon, right? They're going to start mm-hmm. building bases because eventually they want to launch from the moon to Mars. At least Elon Musk does. And once they start divvying up the moon, China's going to say we want this portion, and Russia's mm-hmm. going to want this portion, and yada yada. Then they're going to start selling. I think the uh, the weirdest part <laughs> the the weirdest part of passengers was that. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence could afford to go all the way to Earth 2 or whatever the fuck it was, but she's like a writer. She's, yeah, she hasn't even... She could go even, there and back. Doesn't even seem like she's published yet, either. No. She's, this is her great work. She's going to write this experience. And, yeah, she got a grant from somebody. Mm-hmm. She had a sugar daddy. <clears throat> yeah. She did, had that. Did, do we get the sense, though, that in Passengers, the trip that they're taking is super expensive? Because there is a first class on that on that ship, and then there are other ones who are who are apparently the poor's. On but she's that in ship. first class because she is can she access like the nice so, breakfasts really and all nice that shit. sweet, and she can give him the breakfast foods that he can only get the yeah. black coffee. Does so she maybe she... have money? Like yeah, uh, well, that's like, the thing. Her dad was a famous writer, so maybe right, she right. Just inherited. Why are we spending this much time on this movie? We all hate. <laughs> She's I like, uh, her dad is Christopher Plummer. Do we and, hate uh, it really? I I, I, I love hate it. What I do have is that uh, Knives Out poster is hanging right above my toilet now, so I look at it a for lot. It. Yeah, it's a it's a great poster. It's got like a perfect color, perfect you know layout. Um, I was thinking, man, Christopher Plummer, rest in peace. You know, the, his character is a, is a dick in that movie, right? Like he's, he's a dick. Like he's given, yes, Anna DeArmas' character is fantastic. She's a loving person. She's great. But he's also known her for what? At that point, like eight months, something like that. Yeah. And he mm-hmm. signs the entirety of his stuff. Meanwhile, Michael Shannon, it's not like he hasn't done anything for his dad. Yeah, he doesn't create the content, but like he does the business part of shit. So why is he cut out? Ransom I understand because he's a douchebag too. They're all terrible like, though. I don't think Michael Shannon is terrible. Is he terrible? Uh, he's usually no, terrible. He's not. He's just he's just I mean, he he's the thing that he does that is sort of microaggression in that is that he keeps calling the works their works yeah our, our work. yeah yeah exactly exactly and, and i understand getting peed with that but like it's your son you bring them into the family business sure you you produce the content but he's just, not out there like signing checks to the printing press and shit like that like michael shannon is i do agree that the reasoning he has for giving it to Ana de armas is is weak but uh but yeah all those all those children they, they, you know they, they, there's not i mean there's really yeah, I mean Michael Shannon is is obviously the least worst of them. And everything. Jamie Lee Curtis is fine. I don't know if she, like she she doesn't need that money, but but uh, it looks like it looks like she wants the estate. I think like the uh, the house. Mm-hmm. That's what she and Donnie Donnie J get all horny for. Yeah, 
But she's a she's a nice person. He doesn't I hate just, her. <laughs> I'm glad that though when we send it that the the one thing that came out of that that uh, that I really loved sort of picking on was that his plan to have her like get off for the supposed murder is something that's not going to work. It wouldn't work anyway because yeah. they're going to investigate it and see that he's got drugs in his system. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's <laughs> slicing your own neck. Doesn't mean your drugs go out of your system. Yeah. You've got 200 that. milligrams of morphine. In you. I mean, it's just <laughs> apparently in a fast thinking thing. I can see you may be messing that up, but you know, there was no way he, she was going to avoid anything there. I tell you what, I love that music in Tenet, except for when they when uh, they obviously uh, rip off um, Dark Knight. But uh, I love that music until they just cover up all the goddamn dialogue well, with it, yeah, and it's this, so fucking heavy. That's super annoying. But the music <sighs> at the very beginning when they're going through the opera and everything, and it's like it's really good. And if he's gonna keep doing this thing where he covers up the dialogue with music i'm gonna have to get off the train man like this makes since interstellar this is like the third time he's done it now right yeah yeah and 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 defiant about it too yeah he yeah is. he's all defiant there's, like, there's no reason for it no he no. thinks it's part of the experience but yeah no, as a half deaf person, fuck you. Yeah, I, I already I struggle watch. to hear the dialogue in a normal movie. Sorry, Chris. I sit here and I watch movies where the dialogue is so clear I don't need the subtitles, and then something that came out thirty years later, you know, is like, oh, what the fuck, man? What are they saying? <laughs> the, I know it can be done. I know yeah. that dialogue can be made clear to, to uh, you know, so they barely need subtitles, but they don't do that. Well, listen, I don't have any issues usually determining dialogue. I don't barely use subtitles outside of send stuff, but uh, even I had to put in uh, like headphones to, to listen to that and to actually make it out, especially with, I love Kenneth Branagh in this movie. He's but he's probably my favorite part of the movie. Uh, but with that accent so thick, mm-hmm. I mean, there's just, there's very little time where you're like, oh yeah, I know exactly what he's saying right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your, your boy, R. Pat is really good in that movie too. You should watch that movie. It's a fun movie. If you don't think about it too much, it's a fun movie. I mean, honestly, you're going to be using subtitles anyway. So I is mean, he it, my boy though? Don't well, you I, like him? Or maybe he's more Chris's boy. You like? Robert I think Pattinson. he is better Dude. than his Twilight Years reputation for sure. He's definitely a daring actor in the projects he chooses. I just didn't realize he was my boy, just because of his connection to my girl. Who's got his? Who's got the better career so far, Pattinson or Kristen Stewart? She does by a nose, but they're both very ex- experient, experimental in the types of roles they choose. I'm really curious about this princess diana movie that she's filming Uh, are you really well just because it's a challenge that i've never seen her do i've never seen her do an Mm -hmm. accent um they released that still and they've nailed the look but if her accent is bad that movie's gonna be bad um and like right like americans doing bad british accents is one of the hardest things to listen to in all of cinema um I'll take a British guy with his British sneaking into his American accent any day of the week over that shit. So I'm nervous, <laughs> but obviously I don't think they would have cast her if they didn't think she could do it. Cause it's a pretty big, big role. So we'll see. I'm I curious. Like, I like Kristen Stewart. I don't know what outside of twilight, uh, business wise, what has she been in? that has knocked our socks off maybe snow white and the huntsman like as far as business wise goes yep. not g- good movie wise and then art wise she was in personal shopper mm-hmm. and and i can't think of really anything else that i think she <clears throat> like that 
she really you know stretched in or anything like that Um, she was good and on the road uh but i mean that's that's on the road pattinson (laughs) yeah oh yeah um that's a great scene She's great in uh, a movie before Twilight that I don't remember the name of that Steve Zahn is in. Where she Panic plays Room? A vic- uh, she plays a- what? <laughs> Panic no. Room? <laughs> she plays a victim of assault, um, and Steve Zahn is an art teacher who sort of takes her under his, his wing, and she's really hmm. good in that. Um, There's <clears> that <throat> movie that she was in with James Gandolfini, I think. Um, yeah, the, that- the, yeah, she's like a stripper in that. Um, that movie's not that great. Um mm-hmm. But the, uh, the role in Underwater is different than I think she's done. Um, she's in that um, uh, biographical movie two years ago of that French model who was an activist. Uh, starts with an S. Celine. Studio. I'm going to look this. I'm going to look her. And I admit I've probably seen more of her obscure movies than most people. She's great in Adventureland. Pattinson has a has a, a long line of movies that I even haven't seen that I've heard that he's really good in uh, that sort of started a lot of this Pattinson is might actually be good yeah. talk. Um, but uh, let's look at her pre Twilight. She all oh, the Runaways. I really liked her in the Runaways. Yeah, yeah. she's good in yeah. that. She's yeah. better um, than Fanning. Yeah, Welcome to the Rileys is that I think is that Gandolfini movie, right? You're right. <laughs> um and then uh, uh let's see adventureland adventureland she's really good yeah, yeah that's good stuff uh she's in jumper <laughs> barely uh, i forgot about that she's at the very end into the wild which to be fair she doesn't have much to do in that uh mm. other than be uh mad uh, pixie trailer park girl well yeah and to be sexualized <laughs> in a weird way because she and even though she's like 15 or something in yeah it's definitely is just she really that color. young yeah like the wow. movie came out in 2007 she was born in 1990 so she could be 15 or 16 in that movie. oh wow and there's that. a point where one of the one of the guys is talking to emil hirsch and he goes wow that girl looks like she's ready to jump on a fence post no. no, and I'm just like Jesus Christ, man! This girl is fucking a teenager. What are you uh, doing? This is like, dude, like fifty year old dude with a big fucking. It's like it's it's almost like Steve Earl or somebody says. That. <laughs> don't even know if it's. I don't know who it was, but he says that. Oh Ugh. man, Jesus Christ! Lost City of Z was one that I first heard Pattinson was really good in, and then Good Time. I've seen Good Time. It's really good, and The Lighthouse. God, he's fucking amazing in the lighthouse. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, probably, probably Kristen Stewart by a nose for sure. But once yeah, Batman but- comes out, if that's at least passable, he's going to overtake it, I guess. Well, in terms if of it's success, a, if it's a, yeah, for sure. What's really weird about that movie is when they decide to digitally insert uh, uh, Patrick Stewart into all the Bosleys from the past years or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, we know that Bill Murray was the fucking Bosley and Charlie's Angel. Yeah. So, like, if you're going to use Lucy Liu and Drew Barrymore and all these other Charlie's Angels and then just stick his head over everybody, I don't, it makes no well, sense to me. Well, they're just trying to run with that. There were always 50 Bosleys or whatever, and they made met at a party or so. I love that Michael Strahan is a Bosley. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's there's true. a lot of famous people in that scene, but Michael Strahan is the one that stands out to me. I'm like, fuck you. Mm. <laughs> seem yeah. like a, you seem like a really nice guy. Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> the fuck that, out of here. I think both because I think that movie has found an audience uh, of brethren of mine uh, after its theatrical release. And because I think um, Elizabeth Banks has clout. And if the movie she makes next, this invisible woman that's supposed to be part of this universal monster series is good. Uh, and I think she's starring in it. Um, I think she could probably say to the studio, I want to make another Charlie's angels. And the studio might say, well, maybe hire a couple different actors and the way they made this movie, they can do that. They can just swap out angels willy nilly and keep it part of the same universe. So I'm telling you, don't be um, surprised. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's funny lines. Uh, it's just, you know, it's not great. That's all. 
Mm-hmm. But it's not 4.8, as I was talking about on exactly. Slack. 4.8 is a Ghostbusters uh, penalty. Yeah. I mean, that's this like, we don't like that women made this movie for women and blah, blah, blah. So we're going to make it. It's, it's about a 6.3, but we're going to make it a 4.8. It's very openly a girl power movie. If you don't get that from the opening credits, which is just a montage of everyday women athletes kicking ass over the opening song, then, you know, just, you know, it's your fault. Just tune out af- after that. If that bothers you, the movie tells you up front what it is. So yeah, is the opening opening song. Is that the, uh, don't call me angel, the Miley and Lana Del Rey and, uh, it's Ariana. At, no, I think that's in the credits. The, they they play it briefly in, in like the first twenty minutes somewhere. Hmm. I think, but they don't play. It's I don't remember. Well, I didn't go through. Well, I did go through nearly the entire credits because there's a lot of like extra scenes. Yeah, the, there are the credits. They're fun too. Yeah, um, and maybe they, maybe they did play the full thing, but yeah, there's like there's like the the skydiving where you have Haley Steinfeld shows up out of nowhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, um, uh, <clears throat> the one they play the most is that uh, hurts to be human, uh, or no, um, all girls all around the world, all around the world, mm-hmm. tell it to the girls. Mm-hmm. I don't know the lyrics, but they play that yeah, song like six that, times. Right? There's some kind of rap in there. I'm good at I'm good at rap gibberish. Mm-hmm. I'm just telling you. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, I'm not going to delay this any further. But Jeremy, we need to talk about Eminem at some point. I think he's getting like a thousand percent better as he gets older. I have been enjoying his uh, stuff more because the older he gets, the more responsible a human being he is. Uh, and he's not, you know, such a bigot and he's not trying to be in your face with a put on high pitched voice when I rap about like the, he yeah. just, no, his, his tone has gotten matter. better. Yeah. His, <clears throat> his flow has gotten better. Like he enunciates every fucking syllable yeah. and he's lightning fast. I don't know. Well, they, they clocked him in that, uh, monster song, not the monster inside my bed the the monster the mm-hmm. one that he did with juice world they clocked it that final verse is the fastest rap on record hmm. the yeah. and he didn't take a break it, like it's just it's ridiculous yeah, yeah anyway. it's the it's i don't think i can speak to like the greatest rappers because i'm really only familiar with mainstream rappers mm. and there's like i mean every time <sighs> This happens too often, I guess. But every now and then, uh, a rapper will die young, and Twitter will explode in grief. And I've never heard of the guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. But there's massive respect for his art and his craft. I think there's a lot of rap that I, I'm just not exposed to, and don't expose myself to. But in mainstream, I think he's the best I've ever heard, uh, career-wise, like mm. beginning to end. And it's 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 not just the flow. Some rappers are great with flow, and their their lyrics are dumb as shit. Uh, some rappers like write great, like great lyrics, and their flow is terrible. Uh, but he's got both, man. Um, it's just it's crazy how brazen he was in the early days, and never really ultimately had to answer for a lot of that. Like the, nope. I was just listening the other day, not even the not even the gay slurs and stuff. Uh, which I think he's tried to excuse as part of the culture. Um, but he, there's that oh, that flat out line, like I'm the first person to do black music so selfishly and use it to get myself wealthy. And then he turns that into a diss on other white rappers. But who's going up to him today going, remember how you took black music and used it to make yourself wealthy and openly admitted it. And he will tell you he was in character. He's in as- character. Yeah, Slim Shady. he was in character as Slim Shady and not Eminem, and I think that's a little flimsy. Mm-hmm. Anyway, mm-hmm. love the guy. Mm-hmm. Just he's mm-hmm. not perfect, as you know, few people are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I was getting, uh... <laughs> <laughs> this story's not worth it, is it? This... <laughs> it's, it's true. It was foggy, <laughs> and I was like, "This is not a good." Ah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was. It was delightful, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh Jesus! That's also a Mon Eagle, Mon Eagle Mountains for lovers. Mon Eagle Mountain. I'm, I'm like, 
at a 40 degree angle. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is not you going, through oh, that, you going through that twisty area. Yeah, a little twisty area. Dangerous, man. Reverse. Mm-hmm. Back it up. Yep. Yep. Get uh, get back on I-24, man. Yeah, seriously. Uh, <laughs> Come on home. <laughs> there was one day that I was, um, I was, I decided, I was like, I'm going to have the scenic route driving down to Atlanta. And I decided to drive all highway, no interstate. And I got Ooh. all the way, got all the way to Mont Eagle Mountain, and I was like, "Fuck this, man!" <laughs> <laughs> you get stoplights, you get stop signs, and you're like, "Oh, oh, oh man!" Oh. I used to, I used to go up on the mountain. I used to live at the foot of that mountain for about yeah. nine months in Georgia, mm-hmm. and I used to go up to that. I used to go up on there all the time, but I burned through my brakes like nobody's business coming down that hill. I'm sure, but, uh, man, if you go up Mont Eagle Mountain and go about an hour in. Uh, in the center, in sort of like a cave in area, is one of the coolest fucking state parks I've ever seen in my life. Uh, with great hikes and waterfalls and awesome shit, man. There's lots of cool shit up there. Tim's Ford? What is the park right there? I don't know, dude. It was like 1998. Um, <clears throat> but we used to go up there at night. Uh, we know where that trolley goes up, right? Mm. Uh, we used to drive up uh, at like 9 or 10 at night after the trolley shut down and sit there on the wall next to the the trolley center and play guitars and serenade the city down below. Nice. I don't, I don't nice. think they appreciated it or heard it, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed, I, I enjoyed my Chattanooga, Northern Georgia, nine months immensely. Um, mm, I could dig that. I could yeah. totally see not wanting to drive over Mont Eagle mountain on highways. Actually, wait, no, I was just talking about Chattanooga. That's not Mont Eagle mountain. I was looking at mountain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just confused my mountains. But, it, 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 you know, I mean, it's all the same down there anyway. Um, no, it's uh, it's just, it's funny that you would think after I did that long of a drive that why don't I just go ahead and complete the trip and everything. I think I looked at my uh, uh, GPS and it was like another three hours or something to, George, to Atlanta. And I was like, man, God damn, I've already driven the length, the time it takes to get there. <laughs> so you turned yeah. around and came home? No, no, I got on I twenty four. Oh, I see. I see. I, oh. I I took the I took I got on like the next street that said I twenty four. I I took that. You know, drove like ten miles to get to twenty four, and then got on that. I should clarify: there's no state park that I know of on Mont Eagle Mountain with awesome hikes and waterfalls. That was all Lookout Mountain. All my yeah, Lookout Mountain for sure. Mountain.